he took us each where we needed to be, and because we followed him, we've each had a very good year, and he brought us joy through our sorrow. And for you too, especially you juniors, whatever happens to your class, whatever happens in your life, remember that we've gone through a low time. We've gone through a valley before you, and we found joy in God, and so can you. And this song talks about leaving a well of joy in the valley that you go through. To the valley you've been through, those around you must go to. Down the rocky path you've traveled, they will go. To those learning of your trial, you'll lend the secret of your smile. You will help them more than you will ever know. Leave a well in the valley, the dark and lonesome valley. Others I want to think just for a moment on the mission of Washington Hills Academy. I hope you haven't memorized students. Do you? <laughs> yes? I heard some yeses. Can you say it with me? It's a, if, you don't, if you don't know it, I'll help you out here. Because um, first of all, though, I always share this when, I have our, when we have our mission reports. It is, we are told, it is in a life of blank only that true happiness is found. If you're going to leave a well in the valley, it's a well of joy. How do you get that well full of water? <laughs> it's through service. <laughs> because it's in service, a life of service only, that true happiness is found. That's exclusive. There's only one way of finding true happiness, and that is through service. So it's a well of service that brings us joy. Is that right, Ceci? Okay, <laughs> and then it says, he who lives a useless, selfish life is, what would be the opposite of being happy and joyful? It's miserable. That's what the word is, service and misery. Um, he is dissatisfied with himself and with everything, everyone else. And then listen to this, strength to resist temptation is best gained through 
good. I'm glad some students have been listening. I asked them in Belcar, what do you take away? And it's, it, it is active service that we gain strength to resist temptation. If we want young people to be strong, they have to be involved in active service if they're going to have a vibrant walk with the Lord. And this quotation particularly impresses me because we sometimes think when we get to heaven, you know, we're going to enjoy. We're going to sit on a cloud. We're going to play a harp. We're going to, you know, fly around and swim underwater without scuba gear with the, deer, with the dolphins. And we're going to slide down giraffes next and all those things, you know, that you think are going to be fun when you get to heaven. But do you know what the joy of heaven is? It is. And we are told this, in our life here that's on earth, earthly sin restricted though it is, the greatest joy and highest education, we're after true education here, the greatest joy, highest education is found in service. And in the future life, untrembled by the limitations of sinful humanity, it is in service that our greatest joy and our, and our highest education is found. That means when we get to heaven, what are we going to do? We're going to serve. We're going to serve, we're going to serve, we're going to serve, because there we find joy and happiness. That's the joy of heaven. So I'm going to invite some students to come up, um, Dylan, Jose, Dylene, and uh, Kevin, to share a little bit about some active service that we did. But first, here's the mission of Washita Hills. If you don't, haven't heard it before, it's on the back of your program. It says, the mission of Washita Hills Academy is to nurture its students into a relationship. Can you read it with me? Read it with me. The mission of OHA is to nurture its students in a relationship with Jesus, to educate them for a life of service, and, oops, and train them to take the gospel to the world. That's our goal, our mission. We have three prongs. We have to nurture, educate, and train. And um, the middle one here is one of the avenues we did. Um, is there, make sure the microphone's on. Uh, um, Kevin, since you have the microphone, where do we go? Where do we have a chance to go and serve last, we're, we're, we're talking about last fall. Where do we go and when did we go? We went to the Pathways to Hell Free Mega Clinic in the Real Rogers Memorial Center in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, December 19, 21, And when do we go there? Uh, December 19 to 21. So okay. Last year, or this year. So not long after the school started, we had a chance to go to Pathways. How many know what Pathways is? Raise your hand. Well, we're talking to the choir. Okay. <laughs> um, tell them what Pathways is. They, they seem to know it, but give them a rundown. Pathways to Health is a ridiculously organized but seemingly messy um, <laughs> system. I mean, it's amazing that God, God is, can use them and actually make it organized. But it's a whole bunch of cubicles that the doctors come in and they set up miniature clinics and they give free health care to the public to the people who cannot cannot afford it and yeah how many have been to a pathways to health not not as many as heard about it okay so what he said about the ridiculously organized and yet seemingly messy chaotic was true when you get there you're like wow this is so organized and then when how many people come through six thousand seven hundred total yeah Almost 7,000. It's chaotic, right? But still, it goes smoothly. Jose, okay, so we have this. First of all, let's back up. Where did we stay? And who all went? I think I have a picture. No, I don't have a picture yet. Wh who, where did we stay when we had the chance to go? Well, we actually stayed in one of the students' home churches, um, um, Colton. Um, his home church in Grand Prairie, they just actually recently finished building it, and it's actually not done. But we were staying in the Adventist church there and in the little Sabbath school rooms, you know, on the floor with um, mattress, not mattress. Nice five-star accommodations, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> For a church, it really was. It was a nice church, but it was tile floor or whatever, you know, hard floor. And so we had pads. We're all on the floor. And the girls, though, were on a, they had a little bit more accommodations. Where were the girls at? We stayed at, an, well, a house that was next to the church. But we were also sleeping on the floor. Yeah, but you had carpet at least. <laughs> Plush, thick carpet. <laughs> and two bathrooms, right? Yeah, two bathrooms for all of the girls. So you can imagine how that went inside. How many, guy, how many bathrooms the guy has to have? Half we of all one. had two, right? Well, we had one, but only, only one of them. Oh, could one take had a shower, in. yeah. <laughs> only one shower, and then we had the, 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 the regular bathrooms that we could we utilize. But at any rate, we enjoyed it. Who all went? Um, who all went, Dylan? Uh, we took the whole school and a, I don't know how many staff. 
<laughs> like three staff families or something like that. Uh, all together, it was like 35 or something like that of us. Um, the whole school, we shut down and went. When we left on a... I, did we leave? On, no, we didn't leave on a Sunday. We left on like in the middle of the week, either Wednesday or Thursday. Tuesday. I think we left oh, okay. on a Tuesday. Okay, never mind. We left on a Tuesday, came back on a Sunday. Okay. How far is where we're staying from where the convention is at? Oh, from when? From where we're staying? Yeah, from where oh, we're staying. Oh, it was church. like an hour or 45? Oh, the traffic, it was an hour. It was supposed yeah. to be like 30 minutes, I think, but it always took supposed like to be, an hour. Yeah, that's about right. 45 so, minutes. So, what time did we have to be there in the morning? For the people, for some people, they had to like leave at like five thirty. Is that right? Yeah, and the rest of us left at like six or six, six Thursday. Yeah. And what time did we get back at night? Oh, we got back at I think six. Six or seven. Yeah. Well, it was six or seven ish. And then we had to be up early out the next morning, drive down there. So they're long days. So um, Jose, we arrived the first day. Tell us what we find. Not well that first morning. That is Wednesday morning. We saw a snake of people around the whole building, like twice. It, uh, I couldn't count them. I tried. Um, but there was an immense amount of people waiting outside just to come in. And it was, in, to tell you the truth, it was a little intimidating. <laughs> and once you got inside, there was more people. <laughs> and there's more people. <laughs> And you went down to registration, that's registration, but out behind us and around the building, this long line of people that are there. Were some of them there overnight? Some of them actually even kind of camped out outside. And we could actually, I think, if I remember correctly, one of the days it actually rained. Um, well, that's another story. Though. Well, tell it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently what happened, um, the day we, one of the days it had rained, but it, it rained all in Fort Worth, but it didn't rain around Will Rogers. So the people outside were completely dry for the most part. They were camped out overnight, and it was amazing. We were like, whew. And so you, you finally get through registration. You go in, and you, um, you come to this all sorts of different places. This is a mega clinic. And so what type of services do they offer, Dylan? Well, they have, like, all these different things, and some of them I don't even know what they are. They have like, I know they had x-rays, they had like primary care, I think they had some surgery too, didn't they? They had, yeah. they had local surgery. And they had a bunch of they stuff. They have dentistry, yeah. ophthalmology, enneology you can think of. <laughs> they had it just about, right? Any doctor, nurses, they had just about every area of a hospital they had there. Then they had this place that was a central supply. If you needed supplies, every area needed a supply. Some of us had a chance of working with there. Now, um, let me see, do I have, okay, here's central supply. And um, anybody that needed a, ran out of syringes or something would come to here and say, we need more in our area. They would find it. Some of our workers work there finding the places. But I wanted to talk about this because all of our students at one point or another had the chance to work on something called PAT. PAT. Uh, Dylan, what is PAT? PAT stands for Patient Assistance and Transport. So why is this so in, such an important part of the program? And this is where a lot of volunteers, right here, this last picture is where they're all being trained um, for this, no, this one here, where they're being trained for PAT, but there's a lot more being involved in this. You probably had three or 400 people. How many volunteers all together were there? In the clinic? In the clinic. Oh, all of them were volunteers. Yeah, well, how many? How many of them were there? Well, I don't know. There it was were about 2,000. Okay. About 2,000 volunteers <laughs> plus that are from all over the country and every medical, but a lot of them are not medical professionals. They're like us. They're just helping out. And so the PATs are one of them. And what does a PAT do? And why is it so important? Okay, basically the fact is that there's so many cubicles in this clinic and it's huge. So nobody really knows where anything is. And so the job of the PAT person is to take the patient from one station to the next so that they don't get lost and their paperwork doesn't get lost. So you're simply transporting patients. And um, Jose, we'll come down the row here and you can each share a little bit. You had the chance to serve as a PAT and you have this nice uh, funny um, thing around your neck. What is it? <laughs> um, so basically we were each separated into different sections. Um, and we wore different color lays. <laughs> lays. Um, and I had 
a pink one, others had green ones. Um, depending on where you work, some people were assigned to dentistry and from there take to different sections. Um, but um, where I was set, I was set in primary care to take them to other sections. So depending on which, um, I guess, lay you have war, um, that's what section you're part of. Okay, so let's imagine a patient comes in and uh, they need, um, say, uh, ophthalmology, some ophthalmology care. They go through triage, they go through registration, then they go to triage. Triage sees what they need and sends them to the right place. They come out of triage, what do they have on their arm? Armbands. <laughs> Armbands. And what does it represent? Um, each different armband represented a different cubicle they needed to go How to. How many different armbands were there? Like 28. 28, 30, something like that. Different armbands, each one of a unique color, and you had to be able to identify that armband, and then you had to know that thing. What is that? That is a map of the whole building, and each little square with different initials stands for different sections. Ophthalmology, physical therapy, um, other things I don't remember. We have PC. What does PC stand for? Primary care over here is D, and each one of these is a unique session. You have to identify a section. You have to identify the armband. Then you have to take that patient to that area. Do you just drop them off when you get there? No. You could. I guess. <laughs> go ahead, Dylan. Explain what you do when you when you get there. Well, Mr. Neal challenged us. He challenged us to pray with every person we transported. So we tried. <laughs> Were you successful? Sometimes they didn't speak English. <laughs> and other For times, those who did, yeah. were you successful? Yeah. Tell, tell us about your first attempts. Oh, yeah. So that, that was interesting because I was like, how in the world are you supposed to just sneak in a prayer with somebody that you're, sometimes you're only transporting them like from that end to that end because of where they're going and where they happen to be. And uh, Mr. Neal challenged us to pray with every single person. So I was like, okay, sure. I'll just pray with the person, I guess. So I had in my head, I was like, okay, when I get to the place, I'll just ask, um, hey, can I pray with you? But um, it, it didn't, it, yeah, it didn't come out. I just kind of felt tongue-tied and just like, okay, and just walked away. So, but then after that, I felt like, oh, man, you know, I, I, I should pray with the next person. So like, okay, okay, God, you have to help me. I, I, it's really awkward, and it's really weird. So I went, got to the next person, and oh, I remember, it. I, I said, if the next person can speak English, I will pray with them. And, and then I didn't. So I was they like, spoke like, English. Yeah, they did. <laughs> so then I was like, okay, okay, okay. Third time is the charm, right? So if the next person speaks English, I will pray with them. And then they didn't speak English. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, I'm asking and I'm making like a deal with God all the time and he's fulfilling his end of the promise. What am I going to do? So then the fourth time I did and that started the long chain of praying. Did you find that people wanted, were happy to pray with you? Yeah, they were, a lot of them were receptive. Um, I don't think I got any rejections. We didn't want anybody leaving the building without having prayed with all along the way. They knew we were a part of uh, prayer. The seniors or Ceci, they, all the students had a chance to, um, to here's uh, David praying with one of the students, and um, he has two. You know why he has two on? Can you tell him why he has two on? All right, so basically the white lay stood for those people who could, were bilingual and could speak another language. So for example, David uh, speaks Romanian. Uh, I didn't have one on in the picture that you have of me, but I spoke Spanish, and so I translated in Spanish. I also got to translate for some of the uh, the patients in primary care for their, um, you know. Physicians, yeah. consult, physician consult. So mm -hmm. if they needed a translator, they would call PAT, and those that had the white lays on with without a language, and we had, even in our, billy, in our school, we had Chinese, Romanian, Spanish. Hindi. Hindi. And um, English. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Hindi. some others, probably. Hindi. Um, Hindi, yes. Uh, um, right. hin yeah. Hindi for, um, and so we had, we had, we, we provided a lot of that, but in the whole facility, there was many different languages. Now here's one, uh, Dailene, tell us about this gentleman and your experience with him. All right. So very, the very first day that I got put place as a PAT, I got stationed in radiology. And the problem was that the very first day on Wednesday, 
the uh, x-ray machine had broken down. And so all of the people that had come in Wednesday and Thursday were waiting to get x-rays done. And the line was humongous. People were there for hours on end. and They had to go home the night before they, exactly. without any x-ray and come back the next day. Right? Exactly. And the line was just tremendous. And so everybody was getting like a little cranky. And I had to transport them after they left. So I'm trying to make you know small talk. And I'm like, how do you like Pathways? And, and they're like, we don't like it. You know, We've been having to wait so long. And so especially this gentleman, I remember, he was yeah, he was upset because he had been having to wait so long. But then I started telling him, isn't it just wonderful that you can just get all of this help and that these people are willing to share? And I started to share with him how, you know, Christ wanted to reach out to them. And at the end, I asked him if I could pray with him. And after I prayed with him, he's like, thank you so much for what you guys are doing. It's actually amazing. And I'm sorry for being, you know, rude and stuff. So, yeah, prayer actually helped. Not always were they extremely happy even though they were getting free services, <laughs> because at times things happen, you know. But um, nonetheless, it was a blessing. There was literature, there was people sharing, there was spiritual care. Before they left, Kevin, before they left, what was the last station they went out before they went out the doors? Everybody. Well, at the very end, um, on both sides of the exit hallway, you could say there was this mass of wonderful Bibles and literature, and so they, they couldn't escape without. You know, and they had uh, they had counselors there, yes. right? You would drop them off there, and then they would go through, and they would have spiritual counseling and or health counseling, and then they would finally go out to the exit and leave. So everybody got an opportunity of having some personal one-on-one -on -one time and go out of the pathways with literature. And this was all done free. Now, Kevin, something else we had the opportunity of doing, explain what this is and where this is located at. Well, as you can imagine, it can be a very stressful situation. So the entire time they had usually live music most of the time, um, and we got to participate in some of that. They had a center stage, so we just played a few orchestra pieces here and there. We, the orchestra played. Did the choir play too? Sing? And choir sang. Choir sang. This is the beginning of our school year, but we still had a small group. And we provided live music on several occasions around the, uh, the, the auditorium where it was at in which to help the people as they're sitting there, this was in front of Dental, and the string quartet is playing there, and um, they enjoyed live music as they sit and wait to try to help them enjoy their time as well as relax. And one more, two more areas that we had involvement in, um, Jose, some, uh, none of you all did this, but some of the students worked in child care. What was that for? Pardon? Make Bianca talk? Come on up, Bianca. <laughs> Bianca worked in child care. Tell us what ch child care was. Um, so basically, what we did in child care was we took care of the children of the volunteers who couldn't, you know, take their kids with them while they were working. So we would take care of them until they could come and get. I think kids. they had to be, what was the age? Twelve to to volunteer and do things. Thirteen. Yeah, I think some of the older children could actually help out with some of the volunteering, but the younger ones, you had the responsibility all day long from 6 in the morning or 7 in the morning till 5 at night of caring for how many kids? Um, well, there were two sections. There were for the younger kids and for the older kids. The younger section had like 15 and the older one had like 30 something. 30. And these are for the, the patient, uh, well, not as much for the patients as it is for the volunteers so the volunteers could do their jobs. All right, and then um, some workers, uh, and almost all the students, um, Dylan, had a chance to work in this area. What is this? What do we provide yeah. in this case? So at Pathways, they provide a free lunch to all the volunteers and all the patients that come. So how many is that? So that's like 8,000, well, something like that. I don't know. I think it, it was, was around 3,000 3, each meal because the volunteers and the patients inside the building. We didn't necessarily oh, feed them all true. outside, yeah. but those that were inside. So we had 3,000 hot meals. What sort of things did we fix? Well, there was like a haystack looking thing that I'm pretty sure is called a taco salad. Yeah. And, um, and we had, had 3,000 of those fixed, and how fast? Well, the first one wasn't that within an hour. I wasn't there, but it I think was, it was It was like 45 minutes because we started late. We started late. We didn't even have the supplies. We were waiting for the supplies to get there, and they got there, and we were supposed to have it out. We were late. We were supposed to have it out in 45 minutes, and we had to pr provide 3,000 of these, all mixed together, all prepared, on carts, and delivered. And um, the Lord miraculously provided. We were able to get it done. 
And then we had hoagies one day, and we had, it was a lot of work. We had assembly line, and everybody just making them as fast as they can and putting them in, stacking them up. Lots of work. It was lots of fun. Um, you know, the reason it was lots of fun is because strength to resist temptation is best gained through active service, and it is in what only that true happiness is found. A life of service only. And that is why we have to learn to serve, and that's the mission of Wash of the Hills, that we get students involved in, in in, uh, in missions and in service. So in this case, um, Pathways, the next one I think is in India, um, but um, there'll be another one coming up. If you want to get involved with it, there's the contact information. You can find out where it's going to be next here in the States, and uh, they need all sorts of volunteers, not just medical volunteers, and it's, uh, you'll be blessed if you go and you serve. Um, let's pray together as we close. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that um, we've had this opportunity of being of service this last year, and I pray, Lord, that um, each of those people who were served would continue to not only receive the blessings of health, but would uh, look to Jesus, the author of health, and uh, the one who can restore the soul, and that they might find more about you. Bless us now as we go on to your, your lesson study. In Jesus' name, amen. I was in a different mode. There is a mission offering that is going for the senior mission, isn't it? Next year's senior mission trip, the junior, now senior um, mission trip. Don't know where it'll be next year, but it will be somewhere. Uh, and um, if you want to contribute to that, it would be most appreciative. It'll go specifically for spreading the gospel somewhere in the world and helping young people to gain lives of active service. All right, let's see if we can get something up here. All right, seasons of parenting. Uh, there's a whole lot to say in all of this, and there was a lot of meaningful things in the lesson as well. And I am hoping we're going to have some mics ready to go around. In fact, here's one of them that is going to be ready here. And hopefully I can have someone to... Oh, thank you, Marco. Um to share those around. But let's have a prayer as we begin. I just invite you to bow your heads where you are. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word that gives us principles that we can utilize, that we can live by, and, and find truths that uh, really are meant for our best and that are intended for us to find happier, more fulfilled, satisfied lives. And so I pray for your blessing as we look at these things of the seasons of parenting. I pray that you would bless, that your word would be clear to us, and we would enjoy some time and study here. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I should ask, I did notice that the bulletin, <laughs> before I got the bulletin, I had different timings for things. I had Sabbath school at 9.45, and, I mean at 9.15 rather, and then I had the worship service at 1045. Is it true that, I, that, that the worship service is going to be, we're going to try to start it at 1030? Is that correct? Yes. So that means we are going, buckle your seat belts. Uh, we're not going to get to everything, but we hope to get to some of it good. So let's look at this together. Oops, I've already jumped ahead here. Just after creating Adam and Eve, God encouraged them to become parents. It was plan A for humanity. It was the two together becoming one as a family and, and then being fruitful and multiplying, filling the earth. That was God's plan A. That's what he intended and intends. And a baby usually is raised by a caring father and a caring mother. However, it's not possible in some cases. A responsible parenthood involves educating your children so that, whoops, so that they become citizens of heaven. I want to spend a few moments with you looking at, and uh, I, I realize now I'm not going to be able to do all the group things that I was hoping to do, so stick with me, and if I ask a question, try to just uh, share that. We'll try to get a mic to you. Go with me to Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is, uh, is actually a psalm that was written to Solomon. It was David's psalm to Solomon that was to basically encourage him in his parenting. And he uh, shares some beautiful truths here, some things that at first when you read it, it's like, wait, what does that mean? 
Uh, how is that? But let's go uh, to verse 1. Psalm 27, verse 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. How, what did I say? 27? Thank you. Psalm 127, 127th Psalm. You know, there's no chap chapters in the Psalms. There are songs. They are Psalms. It is, it, and the Psalms is three books put together of the song books of Israel. So, Psalm 127, 127. Yeah, it says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. How many of you have built a house? Okay. Quite a few have, uh, quite a few of you have actually worked to build a house. How many of you have had God build your house? Okay, wow. Did he, was it with a the, with the screwed gun or... or <laughs> Sorry? Oh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, he uses people. He works through and helps and blesses people. You know, physically speaking, a house being built certainly can be through the strength of the Lord, absolutely. It's by his grace that something can be, both having the money to do it and to buy the materials and then to put it all together. Uh, that's with God's blessing. Um, but you know, without God's blessing... A house is merely a fancy stack of firewood when you think about it. It's something that's going to be burning one day. When all the mel elements melt with fervent heat, it will too, and it'll be gone. But obviously, this is not talking about a house with bricks and mortar and the, the wood and drywall and whatever else. You have a comment? Well, I guess you're going there, but I was going to say maybe this isn't a physical house. Maybe this is in a home. Yes. And the next yeah. phrase says, unless the Lord guards the city, God has to guard our homes as well, guard our families, guard the integrity of our relationships. Absolutely. Thank you. So true. Uh, this word, building the house, build, I looked it up because I was wondering, how is that? What is that trying to bring out? It's actually the Hebrew word here in, in building the house is the same word that is used when, God, when it says that God made a woman from Adam's rib. Same word, he built it. There's another word in uh, Genesis 30 uh, in talking about uh, Bilhah being given to Jacob to be a wife, and, and uh, she says that I can then have children. That word have children, or translated that, is that my, I may build her, by her. And so it really connects with building your home as far as numerically with children. And so, so David's saying to Solomon here, hey, when you are building your home with your numbers of children, you make sure the Lord is building. That it's not, now how, how is it that, now, you know, pagans, if you will, someone that totally doesn't want to follow God, they have children. So how is it that they have children, but, you know, build? How do you build, how do you let the Lord build your home or your house? And when, especially when it comes to children. Help me out. Okay? I think of a, a regular house, if, if you want to build your dream home, you want it to be really, really good. <laughs> And so one of the first things you do is look for a really good contractor. You go to the phone book, there's going to be a whole bunch of different individuals listed, but you ask around and oh, yeah. you find out which is the best one because you want the very best job done for your home. I kind of would put that idea in the Lord building the home. There are many uh, places or people that can help you build the kind of home it's talking about here, but we want the very best. Mm -hmm. And if we want that, then we're going to go to the Lord. Amen. So how is it that we build or let him build the house? Dale? This is going to be a home that glorifies God and advances his kingdom. But later on, he talks about these children being an arrows in the hand of a warrior. Not just any war, the war against evil. That's right. The great controversy we're involved in. So I think the home is a similar thing. The pagans can't do that. We, we are building a home that honors God and advances the kingdom, is a, is a place where the gospel is preached. That's right. That's right. In fact, I, uh, 
I think we'll go ahead and read the rest of this psalm real quickly here. Uh, Verse 2, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Interesting there of how we can try and try, you know, I'll stay up late, I'll get up real early, and and we realize, wait a minute, unless God's blessing this thing of, of family and I'm putting him first, it's all for naught, it's empty. There's a comment back here, Melody. Oh, <laughs> someone heard a comment and they want it shared publicly is what it happened. <laughs> no, I was gone and then you moved on and I said it was okay, but... <laughs> Right, no, in terms of building that house, the question you asked, um, I think we have to go back to the Word of God um, to see what His requirements are. And He also points us to the spirit of prophecy to see what the requirements are. And I think if we follow carefully, we're building that house. Amen. Amen. Good. Let's go on to verse 3. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. And then it goes on to say, as Pastor Dale mentioned, as as arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall be not be ashamed, but shall speak with the enemies in the gate. An alternate translation is mine. They shall subdue the enemies in the gate or destroy them. Uh, well put about the great controversy. What, what does the Bible say in uh, 1 John 3, I think it's 8, 1 John 3, 8, that Jesus, what was his purpose? I came into the world to do this. 1 John 3, 8, look that up. Tell me what you find. What did Jesus, what was his purpose in coming to the world? I came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. And so when you see children can be that that extended hand, the sword in the hand of the man of God, who's working to, in the strength of God, destroy the works of the devil. You know, when people see a well-ordered, well-disciplined family, they see, wow, maybe that could work for me too. You know, when I, when I, when I read, I, I was so blessed in doing, uh, have, uh, being a part of a, a class. I taught a class, uh, Sociology of the Family, and we went through Adventist Home. Wasn't that a blessing? Man, and, and when, I, when I read that book and look at it, I realize I have broken at one time or another every admonition and rule in that book. And I'm thankful for a God who restores and blesses Imagine what it would be like if we lived that stuff all the time. What, what, what a destruction to the, to the enemy's, enemy's kingdom. And that's what he wants. That's, that has been and is his purpose. You know, it says here in verse 5, Happy is the man that hath his quiver, quiver full of him. They shall not be ashamed. Go with me to Psalm 40, verse 14. It kind of goes along with the same thing that we were just talking about, but Psalm 40, verse 14, can someone read that for us? Psalm 40, verse 14. Anyone have a mic handy? Okay, right back there, great. Mm. Oh, never mind. I have it in Spanish. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) It would edify a few of us. Okay. Um, I have it. Psalms 40, verse 14. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and to put to shame that wish me evil. Okay, so not be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul to destroy it. The enemy is seeking to do that, mess us up. And by God's grace, we can fight those battles in faith. And like it says in Psalm 31, 1, you can go there with me. I think I'll read this one. Psalm 31, 1. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. By the way, that's the only way we're going to be delivered. (laughs) It's by the righteousness of Christ. Delivered in his righteousness. But we're not ashamed when we're delivered from the enemy seeking to take us down. We're going to look at, as we have time, we'll see, uh, some special cases, not having children, single fathers and mothers, 
We're going to look uh, at educating our children, the principles of education, the goal of education, and when the goal is not reached. We're going to look at those hopefully together. By the way, this is something online. I've modified it some. You can find this. Those of you who are teaching Sabbath school, it's kind of nice to have a little PowerPoint with it too. Uh, you can find that online. You can't get it till about Thursday night, just saying, because that's when they put it up. There's two different versions, and here's one of them. FYI. So in Genesis 25, 21, it says that Isaac, he got married at 40. He marries this beautiful bride of his, Rebecca, and no children come, and no children come. She's barren, as the Bible says. And it says, now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. We see lots of examples in Scripture of, of people who prayed for children. There are several cases in the Bible of women who were ardently wanted to have children but couldn't. For example, Rebekah, as we just read above, and Rachel, and Hannah. And God heard their prayers. There were other couples, older couples, that they had given up. This isn't going to happen for us. Abraham and Sarah and Zechariah and Elizabeth are examples of couples who had given up. However, God came to them and through miraculous ways provided a child for them. Lesson, God hears your prayers, although he doesn't always answer them the way you expect. One day, we will look back and see how the Lord was working behind the scenes. Sometime we think we'll find reasons for things, sometime we won't, but one thing for sure, he will bring comfort to us, and, and we will understand a bigger plan and a better thing than we saw. Some couples decide not to have children. Others prefer to adopt children and give them a better future. Uh, we don't have time to, to do this. I wanted to, to look, well, I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Now, this is, uh, this is not a good teacher, I realize that. I'm not giving you enough time, nor uh, am I, I'm going to try to have your attention back after 15 seconds, but I want you to talk about how, with the partner next to you, how can we show sensitivity to those, uh, to the pain of those who want to become parents but cannot? I want you to just talk about that. Give you 15 seconds. Okay, so let's come back. I want to look at something else here. Single fathers and mothers. I'm thankful for promises like this in 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting how much of your care? All your care upon him, for he cares for you. Scripture shares about single fathers and mothers. There are several examples in the Bible of divorced ones. Thinking of Hagar. She was sent away with her son, away from who had become at least like, if not, her husband. Um, and she was sent away with her son and his son. Single parents, numerous times mentioned along those lines. Uh, pretty sad ways it happened in Genesis 38. Uh, and also widowed mothers that uh, God ministered to through prophets and so forth. Nowadays, the same type of circumstances may force some fathers and mothers to raise children without a spouse. There are some uh, who, who are children of this situation or, or the very spouse uh, or the very individual uh, among us here. This makes the upbringing of children difficult. Single parents should especially trust God who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a beautiful promise. Question, I'm giving you another 15 seconds. How can we as a church support and help these brothers and sisters who find themselves in this situation? I'll give you another 15 seconds. There's a Bible verse there with it too that kind of encourages us to do something.
Okay, if I can have your attention back. Principles of education. Let's read together Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I have something in my bag here that I want to illustrate it with. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and following. I think I might read these. Verse 4, this is Deuteronomy, the 6th chapter, verses 4 and following. This first is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart with, and with all thy soul and with all thy might. That is certainly the foundation for anything before we try to do anything with parenting. And then it says, and these words, speaking of the giving of the Ten Commandments in chapter 5, these words which I command ye this day shall be in, what? Thine heart. We cannot share something we do not have. So it must be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and talk of them when thou sittest in, the, in, in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and thou sh they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. We're going to look at those things briefly. And then I have something in my bag here I want to illustrate. Uh, but maybe I'll, have, I'll do this first. I have something in my bag, something that illustrates child training. I have two things, actually. Uh, and I don't have time to have you guess. So I'm going to take one of them out, and you tell me how that... <laughs> how in the world can that illustrate something with child training? Sorry? Oh, okay, that's a good one. Yeah, teach them to work. Yeah, don't, don't hit them with it at all. Uh, teach them to work. Give them something to do. Now, you probably wouldn't give a two-year-old or a three-year-old this. I mean, they might, I, I've seen little kids, you know, they've got rocks and they're throwing them into the, into the pond and they're throwing it up. And you know, one of these times, <laughs> and they're liable to throw this up <laughs> instead of knowing how to use it. But you, you would be careful which tool you gave them, wouldn't you? Uh, you wouldn't give a two- or three-year-old or even a four-year-old, maybe even a five-year-old, but you would try to train them a little bit how to use it. Uh, but this is actually illustrating a child. And that has to do with the next thing that I am going to get out of here. Uh, the other thing I'm going to get out is something that illustrates this idea. It says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children. Teach them diligently. Teach them. If you look at an alternate translation in many of your Bibles, and some of you may have the version that says, impress them. It's, uh, it's, it's like engraving in their lives these things. And, and it's by, by constant something with an R. Repetition, yes. Can you think of something you would use, you would do with this that would be constant repetition? Uh-huh, a file. Okay, now, those of you, how many of you have ever used a file to sharpen something? All right, quite a few of you. How, you, how many of you have not? Okay, some of you have not. Well, I'll tell you how. You don't just go, ear, 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 like that. That would not be the way. But you, you, you thoughtfully do it in the right direction, and you do it repeatedly. And so sometimes you feel like, man, am I not getting across? I've said this. I've said this at least a thousand times. Might take a thousand and one. Ah, got it through. <laughs> but you keep working at it. And before long, they are sharp arrows in the Lord's hand. And, and it takes repetition. I, re I remember, boy, you know, thinking of this thing of, Basically, Deuteronomy 6 is talking about lifestyle. This is how we do God on, in life. This is how we let him live in us. This is righteousness by faith in action, kids. And by the way, you have to 
be ready and, and willing and able to say, this is not righteousness by faith. What I just did, that's not Jesus' way. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Unfortunately, my kids have had to hear me say that multiple times. But I, I remember one time, and, and you know, it's not so much what you say, but what you do and how you do it that really makes the biggest strikes. I remember one time, Micah, he was like two or three. It was before we came here in Virginia. I remember in our living room there, and there was something on the table, the little coffee table there. And I told this little two or three-year-old, I said, now don't, don't do that. I don't remember what the doing of it was. I don't remember what was there, but it was something on the table. And I said, don't do that. And he promptly walked right over and did exactly what I said not to do. So how did I deal with it? I wish I could say in a very righteous manner. I did this. I said, ah! And then I proceeded to do something else that was probably decent, but not that part. And right after I did that, you know what Micah did? He looked at me, and he went, <clears throat> oh. I'm training him. I'm training him. Don't you hate it, parents, when you see your kids doing the exact thing that you've, trouble, you've, you've had habits of? And you realize, Lord, you must help me. I've got to love you first with all my heart and live this. Let you live this stuff in me. Well, I realize as we crash land this, I will go through this real quick, and I'll share one quote with you, and we'll close. <coughs> Look at all that stuff. Wasn't that going to be good? <laughs> yeah, biblical contrast. I was going to have you contrast good examples and bad examples of, of different ones in Scripture. Oh, we were going to look about I, uh, uh, Abraham, yes, all this beautiful stuff. Yeah, I'd give you the PowerPoint later on. You can look at it and be blessed with it. And then I'll get to this one. We'll close with this. Parents, are you working with unflagging energy in behalf of your children? The God of heaven marks your solicitude, your earnest work, your constant watchfulness. He hears your prayers with patience and tenderness. Train your children for the Lord. That's only possible by God's grace. If he's building the house, it can happen. If it's not, you and I don't have that kind of patience. I know that. You know that. All heaven is interested in your work because they know it has eternal results. Angels of light will unite with you as you strive to lead your children to heaven. God will unite with you, crowning your efforts with success. Christ delights to honor a Christian family, for such a family is a symbol of the family in heaven. Beautiful thoughts, beautiful promise. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, when we look at just a few of these principles, we only got to two passages, but they're rich. There's so much in those that we didn't even get to, but I, I thank you that you are a God who loves us dearly who treats us fairly, in fact, much better than fair. You are merciful to us, and you give us what we don't deserve. And I pray, Lord, that you would build an appreciation and love for you in the lives of us parents and teachers, and that we would reveal that to, to students and our children. I pray, Lord, for... Um, more than human patience and wisdom and working to, to engrave those principles into the lives and hearts of our, our children and those that we work with. Lord, I thank you for your care. Thank you that we can find in you strength when we don't have it and help in time of need. So bless each of us to grow in this area, to give ourselves fully to you, to uh, honor you in what we do and how we do it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.